continent at large. Uh, we have a new AU chair, recently appointed, and uh, she hails from these shores. Uh, the Minister of Home Affairs, uh, Dr. Kosazana Tamina Zuma, has been appointed as the new chairperson of the AU Commission, and uh, we'll be having a conversation with her. And I'd just like to say a very warm welcome to our listeners on SAFM who've tuned in for this conversation as well. And uh, you're watching it here live on SABC2. So simultaneous broadcast so that we can get as many people to have this conversation uh, with the minister as possible. And with that, I say a very good morning to you and welcome. Good morning. Um, this Madam <laughs> Commissioner. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> Are you used to the idea yet? Not yet, but I'll get used to it. I suppose the congratulations continue to fly in. Yes, they do. Are you used to, have you had a chance to reflect on the enormity of the job at hand? Because it is a big job, isn't it? It is a big job. It is a tough job. Mm. Lots of challenges. But I also think opportunities as well. So, All right, 54 bosses. 54 bosses, <laughs> yes. And uh, maybe more because you also have the regional economic communities, mm -hmm. yes. So, All right, let's unpack this because, you know, I think a lot of people here in South Africa in particular perhaps haven't had a chance to really engage with the African Union. The Pan-African Parliament sits here, but not really getting to the nuts and bolts of the organization itself. Incarnated in 2002 from the OAU, tell us a little bit about why that came into being as the African Union. Well, the, the OAU was established, uh, anchored on unity of the African uh, countries, but also with its objective number one, to liberate the continent. And that happened over time, especially after South Africa had been liberated, which was amongst the last. It was then agreed that we need a different focus now. And so we needed an organization that can respond to the changes within our continent, but also to the ever-changing global situation. A an organization that's going to concentrate a lot more on integrating mm -hmm. these three countries now into um, one uh, union, but also an organization that's going to concentrate on dealing with issues of underdevelopment, issues of poverty, so that in the end, and, and peace, mm. so that in the end we can have a prosperous uh, continent at peace with mm. itself and the world, <laughs> um, where its citizens are also very engaged in the change in, in, in changing. All right, so that was the hope. And yes. it's ten years ago now. What would yes, you say? Yes, it's only ten years yeah. ago. Only ten years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How would you say we've done then in trying to realise those ambitions for the African Union? I think we we if if you look at it, um, the first ten years was really to establish the structures. Uh, particularly the commission itself, which is then supposed to be the driving engine for what happens in the, in the member states. I think the commission has been established. Uh, other structures like the Pan-African Parliament, the courts, human rights courts and so on have been established. And I think there it has done relatively well. It has also put some policies, plans together. Um, but I think part of the delay has been the conflicts. Because, as you know, conflicts impose themselves. Mm. And whatever program you've got, if there is a conflict, it suddenly becomes priority number one. Because there is no way you can build a railway line in the middle of the war or you can get kids going to school in the middle of the war. So then the conflicts 
take a lot of time to be resolved. But because of that, the, the AU has also created the Peace uh, and Security Council to allow it to react a bit more quicker to the conflicts than the UN was doing. So I think there has been progress. Uh, maybe now we need to consolidate that progress and concentrate a bit more on mobilizing the citizenry, on finding ways of uh, getting the African Union to be a bit mm. more sustainable financially, and of course to begin to drive the issues of economic development, intra-African mm. trade. We're going to unpack quite a number of those issues that uh, you've yes. mentioned there, but perhaps just to, to get us there, um, what would you see as your big themes sitting as the chair um, going forward? If you've seen Barack Obama talk about uh, medical aid, what would you say is going to be your legacy? What are you looking at? Well, I, I haven't even <laughs> taken my seat yet. <laughs> So I, I, I wouldn't like to definitively yeah. say this is what is going to happen because I haven't seen mm. what is there. But generally, I would think just along a few themes. One, strengthening the organization itself, um, the, the commission itself, would be one of the issues. Is that, do you mean getting more power, executive power, or...? What do you mean? Just being better at what we do. Okay. Yes. Um, and secondly, um, you know, the, the, there's been a lot of talk about intra-African trade, economic prosperity. But one of the constraints there has been infrastructure. And there's been a lot of discussions around that. And... The AU is trying to uh, find ways of uh, financing itself. So I would like to support those initiatives uh, that would bring some finances from the continent. We, 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 we do receive uh, quite a number of donations from different countries which are very welcome and we would like to use them. But it would also be good if those donations were adding on something that we already we have. have. So that's an area. But you see, these issues are all interlinked because you also want to mobilize the citizenry of the, of the continent, um, let alone the private sector, because the private sector hasn't really um, participated as citizens of this continent. So they need to participate in strengthening the union, but of course also in doing uh, their business in the union. Because if, if they are to benefit from trade, uh, we need to be strong to make sure that the intra-African trade is supported by the relevant infrastructure, that the Union Commission is strong itself. So we'd like also the business people to come to the party. Uh, and well, of course, so the business case is, is, is quite straightforward. I think it makes sense. Everybody's trying to get on uh, into the, the continent from outside, and also we need to be trading with each other. We've got listeners right now on the, on the radio listening to this conversation and uh, people watching at home. And I'm wondering, what's in it for them? Joe Citizen, Jabulani Sutole in, in Soweto right now listening to this. Why should he care about the African Union? Well, if you, if you look at the Union, one of, its, um, one of its objectives is that this Union should be driven by its citizens. You see... If we look at the continent, we are a billion plus people, and that is a very big population, which gives us 
certain advantages. But it can only, we can only reap those advantages if we are a billion. But if we look at ourselves as individual countries, small countries, those benefits are not going to accrue to us. If you look at the, the market of a billion people, that's a big market. So people would want to invest in order to be able to also benefit from that market. But if we look at that market and break it down into 54 little pieces, then it's not as, as useful. If you look at opportunities of investments and employment, if we work as, as a big unit, we're more likely to, to benefit than if we were looking at ourselves as small little units. But again, as citizens, we have a lot of influence on our governments. So if we are participating actively in the union, we could bring the change that we want because we are influential in terms of the electorate, in terms of what we can uh, push our, our governments to do for us as citizens. So I, th I, th I think there is a lot to be gained by working and looking at, at ourselves as an integral part of the continent. We talk about being African, but is that our real existence? You know, I think someone sitting here in Johannesburg thinks of himself as a South African. The African identity is a nice thing. But do we really have this connection with other parts of the continent that we can start to demand more from our politicians on a continental scale, or is it still just local issues? Well, I think if you look at our history as South Africa, we've always, especially on the side of the struggle, we've always been part of the continent. Even if we look at our national anthem, it influenced a lot of anthems. The formation of the ANC a hundred years ago, influenced a lot of the other countries and formed their own organizations. So we've been very linked to the continent, both in terms of us participating, but also in terms of the continent supporting us. So we've been very linked to the continent. But we must also remember that South Africa itself can never develop to its full potential if the rest of the continent is not developing. So it's not, when we say we must be part of the continent, it's not about charity or about favor. It's also about our own development. Uh, our fortunes as Africans are inter intertwined, interlinked, and therefore anyone who doesn't think they are part and parcel of the continent who think they can flourish as a country on their own is making a mistake. So we are first and foremost Africans. All right, so um, your election was quite uh, bruising. And this is uh, some of the things that people have written, saying that uh, the six months impasse based on language, um, that unity is going to be one of the things that you're going to need to work on to try and bring everybody back together again. Do you share that view? Well, I think um, the African countries moved on, not just now, but at the time of the election, mm. because we couldn't have had an election where somebody gets more than 60% if people hadn't moved on mm. and actually began to unite right there. But Kenya. So, so I think it's important to stress unity, but not so much because of the way of the election, but because unity is the anchor of our very existence. Mm. When our organization was launched in 1963, that was the anchor, unity. There are lots of things that divide us, even inside the country. Mm. You speak different languages, different cultures, religions, you support different football clubs, 
There are lots of those things. But they are fundamental things that unite us. And so it's the same in the continent. There are those div- div- divisions. But they, are not, they shouldn't be seen also as negative divisions. It's diversity. Mm-hmm. And diversity used properly is actually strength. And so I think there is the, the things that should unite us, to me, are more powerful than the things okay. that should divide okay. us. I, I, I just want to push this a little bit more because I think, you know, <coughs> quite a lot has been written about it, that uh, South Africa used strong arm tactics to get you elected. Um, in fact, the Kenyans were saying, I'm very uncomfortable with the methods of the style of South Africa, that uh, they were entitled to bring a candidate, but we felt that there was too much intimidation. If that is the case, then, you know, whilst they did vote, perhaps they did it with a bit of resentment. I, I don't know who was intimidated because the Kenyans had the freedom to say they will not support us mm. and nobody intimidated them. But we also said we will support you even if you don't support us, which is what we did. So I think we must just move away from that mm. and look at how can we work as a united continent on things that um, are really critical mm. to the continent. Um, in terms of unity, unity is strength. United we stand, mm. divided we fall. Mm. So that has been the motto of the OAU. It has to remain. That spirit of Pan-Africanism has to be enhanced. It has mm. to be embraced because that's the only way we can really take our rightful place in the family of nations, of continents, in the global arena, if we are standing as united. All right. So when you got elected, um, the presidential spokesperson, Mike Maharaj, said that um, y- you've talked about efficiencies. He says, um, you know, it needs, the AU needs to be more effective. He says that um, we were great at making decisions, but not so great at implementation. Is that a view that you share and what, what's going to be different now? Well, I think my belief in my entire life has been that the leader is as good as the team. So I think we sh- I will want to work with the team that I will find there and whoever comes to join the team we have to just work as a team and work together to see what needs to be improved, if anything, and how can we be an effective and efficient organization. So no one person changes things. It's the team. And no leader is better than their team. You are as good as your team. So... That's the first thing I have to do is to get there, see the team, work with the team, go through things together with the team and make sure that we really work as... What will you bring to this team as the first woman in this chair? Um, Well, basically... My view is that one of the things that a leader has to do has to lead by example. If you ask people to work hard, they must see it in you. Um, If you want people to work as a team, they must see it in you. Um, But also, I think... I think women leaders are probably just much easier to work with. They are more approachable. Um, and so I, I think in the end it will be the team that will judge. All right. I, I would imagine that uh, women across the continent are probably going to expect you to champion their issues. Is that something that you're going to be doing? Yes, not 
because I've been ele elected mm. in my adult life, I've always championed women's issues. And I will continue to do so as chair of the AU and beyond. Yes, indeed. And I'd really like to work with women. Mm. Um, they must define the change they want to see and be the change that they want to see, as Gandhi said. But, um, yes, I would be championing. And, and it's not just because I'm a woman. Um, I probably would do it even if I was a man, because I think it makes sense. Because if you educate uh, women, you scientifically it has proven that uh, if you educate the girls, you improve maternal mortality, you improve infant mortality, you probably improve the nutrition of the family, and, and therefore you are contributing to healthier um, families. And of course, we know that women, they work, and the first thing they think about when they've earned money is their family before anything else. And so that way you'd be supporting the family as a whole, okay. and you'll be supporting and communities as a whole. <laughs> some men do, um, I must say, some men do. But they think about other things as mm. well. Um, their priorities are not exactly the same as ours, but they do. And that's why we want to be empowered, mm. to be emancipated, so that we can support what they do and, okay. and, and do it um, more. And uh, that's why people say when you educate a woman, you educate a nation, because women just take tend to take care of everybody else. All right. If you've just tuned in, you are watching a special broadcast on SABC2. Uh, we're talking to the uh, newly appointed AU chair, Dr. Nkosaza Nadlamini Zuma, who's still the Home Affairs Minister, but will soon be packing her bags and going to uh, live in Ethiopia at the uh, AU headquarters. And you're also listening to this special broadcast on SAFM right across the continent. All right, let's talk about the AU and its record. Um, a lot of people have criticized the AU perhaps not always being on the same page when it comes to big issues. When we look back at the Arab Spring, for example, with hindsight, were there any lessons learned with the way that we dealt with Libya in particular with the Resolution 173? Well, I, th I think any situation brings lessons. Um, and so we should learn lessons from the, the Libyan situation or any other situation. So, yes, there are lessons to be learned. Um, and, of course, those lessons that have been learned, hopefully, will uh, assist in future what, situations. What could we have done differently, do you think? You know, I don't think it helps <laughs> to say what could we have mm. done differently. Because what has happened has happened, and nobody can change. What is important is to look to the future. Um, I think we could have just scrutinized that resolution a bit more, if you like, because that resolution was very good, and it was supposed to uh, protect the civilians. But it had something at the end. There were four words at the mm. end that almost gave a clean slate, a, a, a blank check to the people who were going to use that resolution. When you start saying, and any other means, mm. then that creates a problem. But the resolution and the intention of the resolution itself was fine. Um, so I think to try and delve into what happened and what could we have done better. But were you not concerned? It's just the lessons yeah. that we have learned that we must then take forward. Uh, right. But were you not concerned that, that there wasn't always unity on the position to take during that time? We saw Botswana, Kenya in particular, um, say, look, we're going to go with the rebels or the resistance. And the African Union was still 
um, uh, punting for diplomacy and uh, middle road. And in fact, at one point, we're saying that we've got to negotiate with uh, the, the colonel. Well, when you've got 54 countries and something like that happens uh, suddenly, obviously it takes time to get uh, everybody to think in, in one way. But I think what, it, what, what is important in those situations is just to discuss and see mm -hmm. what's best, not only for the country, but its population and, 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 and so on. So there will be situations like those. I don't think you'll ever find a situation where something happens immediately and everybody thinks alike. That's why people have to meet, discuss, convince each other which way to go. Um, so I'm not saying in future there will never be those diverse uh, views. There will be diverse views, but it's how those diverse views then impact on the actual situation. Do you think that the AU has the will or the backbone to deal with wayward members when they do do wrong? You know, the, the AU, <coughs> if, you, if we start from where the OAU mm. started, mm. the OAU had a, a, a principle of no interference, full stop. And so you were not supposed to do anything, no interference. But the AU has moved. Of course, you can't move dramatically in situations like that. You move step by step. The AU has moved, and it has, it has said you can't be, um, you, you, you can't just l look on when something is going wrong. Mm -hmm. Two, it has said people who come through coups will not be accepted. Whereas during the OAU time, it didn't matter how you became president. Once you were, you were accepted. So now you are not accepted. Your country can't sit behind its flag until you have resolved the issues and you have had an election. So that's a big step in terms of democracy in, in, in the continent. And not just democracy, but how the AU influences countries to move towards democracy. Because even if you have had a coup, you can't go and sit there until there's been proper democratic elections. So I think that's a very big step forward, in my view. And secondly, they've also said we can't be indifferent when we see that there is serious problem in another country which is, again, a very big move from the categoric no interference. Now it says you can't be indifferent. You have to, con to be concerned when you see things going wrong. So I think it's moving. In the 10 years, there's been quite a shift. Um, what it hasn't, it hasn't gone further to say, if you, 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 to dictate how many terms each, each president right, right. can run, that, that it hasn't done. But do you think there's been a consistency of application? I mean, what you're saying makes sense, um, but some would say that some countries are let off the hook more than others. Like? Well, let's look at Zimbabwe, for example post-election mm. violence and, and the intimidation that continues there. And then you look at a, another country like um, uh, uh, Ivory Coast, where forces were mobilized very quickly, moved in, and the problem was dealt with. Other countries, perhaps not. Well, if you look at the Ivory Coast, I'm not sure when you said people moved in and everything was done well, swiftly. The Ivory Coast problem started in 1999. Right. That was my first uh, encounter right. when I was appointed foreign minister in 1999. I remember December, mm -hmm. New Year's Eve, Christmas Eve on the 24th, 
there was a coup in Ivory Coast. And that problem lingered on mm. until now. But post the election? Well, there's been, there was an election yeah. then, even then, and there was a problem. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a problem that has been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. But, of course, when it was, um, when, when this last election took place, yes, uh, there was swift, there was swift movement and the problem was resolved in the way it was. I agree. But it had been a festering problem mm. itself for a very long time. All right, let, let's talk about another area, Somalia. That's, <laughs> no one seems to have a solution there. And unfortunately, you're going to have to be having this on your desk in one way or another. Is there hope for a country like Somalia? 20 years down the line, it's still problematic. Well, I think as Africans, we can't throw the towel and mm. say there's no hope. There has to be hope. And the fact that there are countries, there are forces from different countries from Africa who are in Somalia shows that we think there's hope and we are trying to make a difference uh, by by having sent those troops. There has to be hope for every country. Yes, it may be a difficult problem. Yes, it may, it, it may, be, it may look intractable, but a solution has to be found. Of course, a solution can never be imposed completely from outside 